we go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 2024. It's our first meetup for the year. Couldn't believe it. It's like it was just the other day that we saw you guys, and now <laughs> it's already a couple months back again. Yeah, I <laughs> can't believe we're halfway through February already. Valentine's, which completely snuck up, but I get to escape to Cape Town tomorrow, so <laughs> I get to bypass that for a little bit. Okay, so just a quick one. Uh, we are recording the session. These are kept up to date on a YouTube channel, so if you do miss out, go and grab it. Just for those online, just please keep yourself muted just to avoid interruptions, but please don't hesitate to ask questions, okay? So tonight, we're going to go through in the news. Then I'm going to take you through using GPT-4 in Power Apps, specifically the vision component of it, so to be able to identify an image. And then we're going to have a look at a prompt manager. So a big thing now with all the pilots, all these gen AIs is getting the right prompts. And there haven't been many platforms where you can go in and share prompts uh, with a wider audience. There is the prompt or the co-pilot lab that's available, but that really focuses on co-pilots. With things like the prompt manager, you can utilize it across multi, multiple different LLMs and gen AI models and that. So I'll show you how you can use that and the value that it adds. Then um, David's going to take us through the approvals kit in Power Platform. This hopefully addresses a lot of the challenges that we've had with the approval connect in the past that we've discussed <laughs> quite a bit already. So hopefully this does solve some of the challenges. Then Michael's going to take us through using C Sharp in Power Platform. I can see he's busy starting his prep now, so he should be done by the time we get to that. And then we'll just open it up to general Q&A, and then we'll, of course, have the social and drinks and that in the front. Bam. So, starting off in the news. First thing, we are two weeks away from the Global Power Platform Bootcamp. Okay. So, if you haven't registered already, definitely go in and register. This is going to be the 2nd of March. Uh, we have released the schedule, so you can go in and see what sessions are going to be held, who's going to be running them, so you can start to see which tracks you want to follow and you can plan accordingly. It is going to be a full day. You can see we've got a full schedule coming up, so definitely go and register. Just go to josiepug.com. You'll be able to see the schedule in there as well as the link to go and register and book for the event. Okay. So that's going to be really exciting. The team is putting in a lot of effort to make this impactful and worthwhile for you all. Okay. Now, just a couple of the news items. There we go. Of course, wouldn't be a session without mentioning some sort of co-pilot. So now we are bringing co-pilot to help fill in forms in model-driven apps. So what this is going to do is it's going to look at the form and it's going to put in values that it feels should be captured in there. Now, that's not a definitive value. You can still go in and change it afterwards if you want. But the idea behind this is, once again, just to help speed things up. So you can go in, see what the suggestions are, either accept the suggestion or uh, change the value completely from there, depending on what you're looking at doing. The information, well, it's going to pull through based on the information inside Dataverse, based on historic information, filling it out, previous records. So how accurate this is going to be, it's yet to be seen still. <laughs> hey, neural link has reached human testing, so that's not a far off idea. Other one now, environment variables are now always going to be visible and editable during the solution import. Okay, so now I know the challenges that this comes. If there are values in the past, if there were values in those uh, variables, it would be bypassed during that process. So all of a sudden you would see the environment variables populated with some information that you had no idea how it got there because during the import process it's ex excluded. Now through every import, it's going to show you all the variables and you can customize them during that process. So this is going to be great to see. We're also changing the ability to bring in custom document field types or field types in uh, AI Builder when extracting information out of invoices. So you can go and set the field type and the values and how that is populated. 
this next form, this one shows it really nicely. So you can go in and add a value, add a field, and then go and set how you want that date structured out in this case. So we have, you go day, month, year, month, day, year, or year, month, date. You can go and set it out properly. So now this is going to add a bit more customization and get a bit more accurate and getting the data into the format that you need it in. I still think it's going to have some challenges. I mean, if like if it's the 13th month, there's no 13th month. So I think it, I'm still interested to see how it impacts other dates. So the first of the second. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but. I think what David's going, if you get an invoice in that's in a different format, how is it able to differentiate that? Because you're not telling it what format that form is in. Yeah, so that's going to be interesting to see. Another one that was quite interesting that snuck in is the ability to drag and drop controls between different containers. So the new responsive containers, you can add items in, but you can't just drag them across between each other. Or one, paste it in the other. So it's frustrating. So we've now made it easier that you can just drag and drop them across, making it a lot easier and quicker to work with. They also, yes, yeah. And now the idea is that it's able to pick up the new coordinates, it's able to pick everything up and be able to adapt accordingly, which is going to be great. Um, we also introduced formula columns as well previously in Dataverse. Uh, you now have the ability to use natural language to get that formula created. So we don't understand people aren't always up to speed on PowerFX. Now, using that Copilot, we can get suggestions on how we want those calculated columns displayed. Okay, remember that expressions just showing you, um, well, it's that calculation to be able to display something inside there. Now you can use those suggestions in natural language to get out that response. Yes, please double check the expression. Make sure it might help you move quicker, but just double check and make sure it is actually what you're looking for. Another one, another nice to have comfort feature is now there is going to be an inactivity time window on Canvas apps. Now, this is more of a challenge if you've got multiple people working on the same app. Someone's working on it, steps away from their desk, and for the next six hours, they just leave it open and it will stay open. Now, it's going to eventually time out. Now, if you've got auto save enabled, that is fine. It will keep on saving, so your uh, previous values will be there. If you don't have auto save on, there is going to be an option for the person who's trying to take over the session to save those current changes as well. Okay, so that way, hopefully, we don't end up losing anything. Yeah. What could go wrong? <laughs> Perfect. Anything else anyone came across that they want to mention? Anything in the news? Anything happening that they thought is quite exciting or cool? Yes. No, it's going to take you a while to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just confuses everything endlessly. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So now at least you can do it during that import process. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, there we go. Not all of us are fancy enough to use pipelines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. <laughs> Perfect. Anything else from anyone? Anyone online wants to add anything or bring anything to our attention? Everyone's quiet. Okay, perfect. So let's jump in here quickly and have a look at a There is a comment. Here. There is a comment online, yeah. Um, oh, is there? Welcome, I... Manny. Th thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's just so see. So there's a comment here. I'd say the ability to draw a UI and have it consumed and built by Power Automate. I think it uses GPT-4. No, well, the image to, oh, by Power Automate. Okay, that's quite interesting. I need to have a look at that. So I'm assuming that would be like something from a Visio diagram that you could then import and then be able to create the flow from there. Definitely something I want to check out. Okay, yeah. So Power Apps, yeah. So Power Apps has had the ability to create a app from an image for a while now, which is quite nice. It does have limitations, only single page app. Um, and a couple of other restrictions, but it does work really nicely. And then we did a session last year still on Figma UI, where you can design your app in Figma and then bring that layout into Power Apps as well. So that's also a great feature to help get you moving quickly. Okay, so it's, it's app. this app I did show off last year, this has a bunch of demonstrations on integrations with OpenAI. It is powered by Power Automate in the back end to speak to a GPT model and then bring back the content. The recent ones I've added in is bringing, uh, utilizing AI Boulder image recognition versus utilizing GPT-4 for uh, recognition of an image. Um, so let's go back again. I wanted to show you the differences between these two. So if we go to our boulder, a bunch of images here that I've uploaded. Let's choose this one and we can go and predict. Uh, I do think this one does work a bit quicker than the GPT-4 one. It's obviously less steps and it doesn't need to go as far. But you can see there, it picks up a person and a dog at a picnic. Okay. Yeah, at least one person. So it's giving you more or less an idea of what is in there. Let's now have a look at the same image, but going through using the GPT-4 vision model. So this is taking that image URL, sending it through, processing it, and coming back. Okay, I'll have to check this one and then see why did I change my, I might have changed my key. <laughs> yeah. okay, so let's look here quickly. Let's have a look at my flow quickly. I'm going to flash my keys anyway, so I'll just delete them afterwards. If I had any control over it, <laughs> let's see what you did. Okay, so the format's coming back is wrong. Yeah. 
Yeah, retired properties are missing. Okay, so I have to play around with that. It's obviously changed since Friday. Yeah. Let's do this quickly. Live troubleshooting. So this runs through. Come on, there we go. There we go. Okay, so that ran through. Yeah, now let's go. Scrub the image one more time, and that's looking better already. Perfect. Yeah. So we'll give this a second to run through, and then you'll see. So if you recall, the previous description was a person and a dog in a park. Look what you get from Azure OpenAI. So there's quite a significant improvement in the response that you get. And what's also nice about this, with proper prompt engineering, you can customize the layout on how it responds. So you could say, okay, respond with a list of all the assets in a tabular format or in JSON format, and it can give you that as you need. So you can use that output somewhere further on. Now we're playing with a couple of things around this on how we can utilize this in other scenarios, maybe monitoring webcams, maybe picking up uh, other items inside of a business. But this definitely adds a lot of value and it's fairly quick and easy to set up. I mean, you look at my HTTP request, I've all changed my, um, my keys later. But let's go in here, yeah, HTTP. You can see I've just got my endpoints, I've got my content type, and then I've got my body structure inside there. And it's just that variable that's coming through. And you can see all I'm saying is describe this picture, but I can go into a lot more detail. Some of the caveats, Mike picked this up, recognizing people's faces and being able to identify people specifically. It is going to avoid anything with race, anything with age, anything with gender. This is due to the content restrictions available. I was testing out the same thing with uh, another model running on my machine, and it was able to pick that up. So it's definitely the content restrictions that are blocking it on Azure OpenAI. Hey, May, we've tried. It's difficult. We haven't figured it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes you want to utilize it for a valid reason, and that's where the challenge comes in sometimes. Okay. So the next one, Prompts Manager. What I will do is I'll post a link to this GitHub repository. Great solution. It can help you share prompts inside your organization, but then also people can go in and create their own favorite list of prompts. So you can see I've created a couple of categories. I've got development, low code, IT, finance, marketing, HR, and then I've got a couple of different products as well. So if I wanted to have a look at, let's see, marketing, and I can see there's a customer feedback app for uh, Power Apps or even in Dali, generate an image. And you can customize the layout of the field, but if you like something, you can always go and add it to your favorites and this really took just a few minutes to get deployed i want to create a new one i can go in give it a name the actual prompt the categories the products and any notes associated with it you've also got the model driven app as well which is this which is going to help us manage this end to end and we can start to see all the various items inside here so yeah i've got my category my products my categories and then we've got all the favorites. So I've got those ones that have been accessed in there. So from now, you'll be able to manage that end to end. 
I will share this GitHub repository with everyone, um, especially if you're looking at uh, users using AI and these prompts inside your organization. This is a great way to create a collection of prompts. So not everyone needs to be an expert in prompting. I'll figure out something, I can go in and upload it and then share it with everyone else. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Hope you found this interesting. Love it. Hand over to you. Right, so it's almost like the CAT team saw one of our videos at the end of last year where we spoke about approvals and business processes and all of these sort of things. So they came out with the approvals kit. And it's it's essentially everything that the approvals connector should have been in the first place. So it's it's a it's a lot of work that's gone into this. And I think that to build this would would take quite a considerable amount of time. So definitely have a look at the approvals kit. It fixes a lot of the problems from the normal approvals connectors. So who can tell me some of the challenges that they've experienced on the approval connectors? And then we see which of these the approval kit will sort out. So Rod. All right, so Rod is saying that if it's waiting, if it's waiting for approval, it's stuck there. You can't overwrite that step or send it back or whatever. So it's sort of stuck there. So yep, definitely. Any other? If I talk about the approvals connector, does everybody know what I'm talking about? The the built-in Power Automate approvals action connector that you wait for approval and then you build the logic in Power Automate to do something based on the response, right? What else? What other challenges are there with Reassignments via admin, and just in general, knowing what's open and where it's, it's sitting and waiting, and how long it's been waiting, and those sort of things. Visibility, customization of the prompts, reminding people. But don't people in your organization just do it straight up? It's the it's 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 the do it's the do it now principle. It's just do it now, and then you don't need reminders. Yeah, reminders, formatting of messages, out of office, keeping track of who's in the office, who's not, working hours, making sure that it's not sitting and waiting for somebody who's only going to arrive if there's an emergency procurement that needs to happen on a Sunday morning, that it doesn't wait for somebody to approval until the next morning kind of thing. Escalations, yeah, it's a good one. All right, so I think the good news is a lot of those are actually addressed, and uh, it's still in preview, so it's it's licensed to still have bugs, right? So there are a few nigglies. Don't put it, use it in production, but definitely go and play around with it, and I think it's going to do a few things. It's first of all, it's an awesome tool. I think it's going to grow. It's going to mature into a, a very strong product. I think. Um, but second of all, it's going to give you a, quite a good view into some really good design practices and, and design principle, the principles in the way these flow work, um, the way that it's logging exceptions is nice, um, where if a flow breaks, it doesn't track the flow and then the environment administrator needs to go and look at the run logs. It actually outputs into a table. So you can do nice, sexy things like assigning it to somebody to look at and those sort of things if there's exceptions in these flows. So there's a couple of very nice design principles that I really recommend you go and have a look at. So to get started, go to aka.ms forward slash approvals kit. And the documentation is quite, quite good on how to get it up and running as well. Um, so you can step through this. I'm not going to go through this now. I'm thinking about doing another session on this that's a little bit more in depth 
Um, so I'm going to show you today, but doing a more in-depth, you know, on how to set up some really complex scenarios and these sort of things, and then we'll possibly go through the installation as well. Um, but that's going to take a lot longer than what we, we're planning to do today. So go and have a look at aka.ms forward slash approval skit. Um, it takes you through how to get it installed in these sort of things. Um, <clears throat> so unfortunately, it does require some licenses, right? So it's not uh, it's not free um, because it uses Dataverse. So everything in the back end that's driven by this, the way that these processes are uh, saved and, and stored is all using Dataverse. So you need a license for Dataverse but, or for a premium license for Power Apps. Uh, but also a license for Power Automate for the person creating these things. So that gets a little bit technical, uh, but essentially there is some licensing implications on, on using this tool. All right, so if we look at, uh, I'm just going to go out of this, and so if you'll see, there's a business approval management model-driven app. And if we launch this, See, there's the home page. And that gives me a nice welcome screen. Again, from a look and feel perspective, there's quite a few things one can learn from this. It's it's actually very nice, nice to look at and, and to touch. Um, so over here you can see configure basic settings. And this allows me to go and say who's my approval delegate, who's a backup delegate. Um, whether the, out, the, the Outlook notifications, what sort of not notifications do I want to receive so that you could set up different templates for the environment. Um, you can go and say whether you're out of office. And you can also go and say, what is my working hours? So that's the standard working hours. And then the associated public holidays are for South African as, as an example. Now, all of these things are set up in by the administrator. Um, and then you would go and select these things. One thing that I think would probably happen in future is if you enable your out of office in Outlook, that'll automatically go and enable that option. I think that'll be a, a nice addition. It's actually technically quite easy to do as well. So I think that's probably coming. But yeah, very nice. Uh, I like this. Um, I think it's definitely, you know, adds a, a lot of value to, the, to that process. So we spoke about the overrides earlier, you know, so there's an approval overrides different workflows. We'll go into those things in a little bit more detail later. But just to get started, I'm just going to go into this area over here and select Approvals Designer. All right, so let's do a process. What process are we going to be doing? Now I'm asking what process are we going to be doing? What do you want to approve? Approval process, great idea. Let's do an approval process. Let's do, I don't know, um, food orders. All right, like it. Food orders, you can see there's this very nice interface over here. Um, that's definitely a lot better and better to look at and nicer to look at than building a approval kit in a power or approval action in a power automate flow. So this actually feels like it can go places. Um, so it's got a big plus. So I'm going to go and click on it. Right. And the first thing is it's going to have stages. Now, we spoke earlier just before the meetup as well about business processes. And there's a the, the, the concept of a stage versus a step is sort of used interchangeably, but they've gone for the stage route. So essentially all the different steps in the approval process are stages in, in this terminology. I suppose it's similar to the BPM flows. So yeah, I'd be surprised if they went another route. All right, so let's say the first one is submit. And we can have a description. There's no conditions because it's the first step. So it's, it'll just Carry on from here. So small little caveat. So you'll see that if I click on save, sort of at the top of the button, it doesn't do anything. If I move it down a little bit, then it does something. 
Anyway, so that took me about 42 minutes to figure that out. All right, so, so you'll see there's a stage and then there's a plus inside the, the stage. So let's go and click it and you'll see there it says I'm adding a node. And the node now essentially represents a person or an entity that needs to do the approval. Now there could be multiple nodes in a stage. So if you think of you could have an approval stage in the process and then you could have multiple people in there. You could have um, management approval or exco approval as a stage and then you could have multiple nodes in there. Um, and I'll show you I'll show you that in a few. All right, things like it's going to allow me to save this without specifying the name, but then it's going to break. So, you know, small little validation issues. Sure, we'll get there. Uh, but for this, let's say this is uh, the submit node. And it's got a, a bit of a, an interesting concept for the person who kicks off the flow. Or sorry, the process needs to do the first approval. So if I go and create a record in Dataverse or in SharePoint and that kicks off this process, so something needs to initiate it. And so there's this concept of a self approval that they talk about in the. the so yeah, that's it. Just keep that in mind. It's uh, I'm not quite sure why it's done like that or if it's really that necessary, uh, but just to show you how that works. You'll think that I get that right after 26 years. 26 years, yeah. Another thing, if uh, if I go and click on save now, it's going to break. I need to go and first add this. It's the same. It's exactly the same that you would get in a, the approval action, where in the connector, where you you can actually go and specify custom actions or and these sort of things as well and and what this is if you think about it it's a way for you to profile the the metadata that's going to be used in the actual approval flows in the back end of this this thing is running approval flows out of the quasi i'll show you the solution in the back end but these tables and flows that'll bend your mind okay to get all of these things to to work so over here you could have a static user and this is what we've done over here but you can obviously do a dynamic one as well, which is probably more what you would want to be doing. Yeah, so don't hot code it. Correct, so then you can tell it to, uh, it's the manager of the initiator or it's the manager of another person or it is, uh, or you can say just use a data field on the on in the data. Actually, not in the data. What it does, and I'll show that now, is when you call this thing, when you initiate it, it asks you for these parameters. So you pass them in, um, which is one of the caveats, which I'm not particularly fond of, because if you if it kicks off the process, it's completely separate from the data. So if you then go in and change the data while this approval is happening. This guy thinks he's approval some he's approving something where he's actually not, you know. So, but that's the same with that's the same with normal uh, the approval action as well. So it's no. So all of that you'll still manage in the data source, um, and so you could all of this is stored in Dataverse. So you could go and track. Uh, set up custom flows to listen to where these different stages and then trigger ownership changes and these sort of things on the actual record in order to to have certain security restrictions but it's not baked into no so mm.
Yeah, so. So. So did the the guys online get all of that? All right, so the question is just how do you make not hard code names in here? So if you've got 80 groups that you'd rather use in order to populate these names. So I'll show you now when we call this, you'll probably set this up. Let me save this quickly and then I'll show you what you'll typically do there. Um, so again, what's the notifications? That's just the default notifications. So you can go and set up different notifications. And then also the, the delegation rule. So is it a, a timeout that it needs to trigger delegation for? Is it an out of office or is it both? Um, so you can go and say if it's a timeout rule, it's supposed to ask me for how, what is that timeout? Although, just bring it to, again, just remember to click in the bottom half of the save button. No, this is plug this in. No, you don't want to build this. You don't want to. Yeah. So if I click on variables, so this is going to tell me what data when I call this. So I'm going to be calling this an instance of this flow from Power Automate. So typically what you'll do if you create a record in Dataverse, um, there'll be a, a trigger, a normal Cloudflow trigger that'll go and call this function and then pass, and this is where I'm specifying which parameters to pass to this flow at the time of running. So one of the things that I'll then do is go and say, you know, who's the FD, and that'll be a user. And so when you call this, you could have a the flow to go and check the AD groups and populate this name, and then the, this will actually know who to send it to. So you don't have to hard code it in there. You could make it more, more dynamic. All right, so let's just as a, that's all you need to actually get going. So you need one stage, at least one stage. If you don't have one stage, there's no process. So at least one stage and you, you're cooking, you're off to the races. So, so let's go and save this. And publish this. It goes through those checks, gives you the option to activate this process after it's been published, so it's version controlled. Um, so it'll actually, if I don't activate this, the previous processes will continue running. If I activate this, the previous processes will con continue running. So it won't, once a process kicked in to a specific version of this flow, it'll follow that right to the end, which is, which is quite nice. Um, let's go and publish this bottom half of the button. Yo, this wasn't done in half an hour. This is, is a lot of work that's gone into this. It's a cus I think it's a, a a lot of this is custom pages, um, but I think there's there's also code components in this. So that designer is definitely a code component. Yeah, that's very really nice. So all right, so while that's pending, you'll see the publishing status is currently pending. Yes. I'll show you what it does now, um, and, and I think it's, I think it's maybe to do with, because the data is separate from the process. If I go and save something in SharePoint or in Dataverse, it doesn't automatically mean that I've submitted it. You know, I don't know if it's maybe something to do with that. Where, from an audit trail perspective, you want the first guy who submits this to go and actually formally, go and say yes, submit this or something like that. So from from what I from all of the documentation, they have that first step, but I can't see from a technical perspective why you would need it. If if you had somebody else in that first step, they would just get that. So Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to nod in small because I don't know the answer to that one. Um, yeah. Other, yeah. Possibly. All right, so now how do you consume that? So we've got that process now. It's built. It's ready. It's ready to go. Uh, but what do you now do to actually call that? And this is where you'll go. So the right way of doing this is now creating a solution that listens to your data database or your entity or your table, and then have a flow in there that will call this. But I'm just going to go and just create a flow in the environment. Just make sure I clicked on the bottom or off of the button. All right, so there's a flow that I've built. Um, you'll see that this is not rocket science. So all that this is doing, it's going to ask for certain parameters. Um, and this is simulating the flow that you'd actually have that listens to your data. So actually, we've I've just created this for testing purposes, but actually this will be a flow that listens to a table or an entity in Dataverse and then instantiating this process once that, that gets created. So you could, yeah, definitely. So, all right, so in here, um, let's do... Okay, so you'll see if I change the business process flow, you'll see that it now, I'm just going to do this from this beginning so you can see how that works. And let's trash that as well. So if we go into custom, you'll see that there's an approval skit connector that we're now going to call. So this is this has a custom connector in the back end that's driving all of this. So if we go and say start business approval process, it asks me which process. And it'll give me a list. And there's my food orders version one. So you'll see some of those others that I've been demoing, they in higher versions. But in this case, I'm going to kick off version one of this. So it's also important to keep in mind, if I go and create a new version of the process in the kit, it's not automatically going to consume that new process from the flows. The flows will still be using the previous one until you're going. And I, I'm still deciding if I like that. Um, all right, so requested by, let's just say, there's an email over there, and external reference. So I think the external reference is meant for like a link to the actual data or a reference number or something that you can use to tie back to the actual actual data request. Mm. Yeah, no, it's like a couple of stuff that I looked at this and I'm like. That's some that's some good swagger right there. I think that's. All right, so let's go and trigger this. And then let's open up our automate so we can actually go and track that approval. So. The interface where people then do the approvals is still through Power Automate. So if somebody to approve something, they don't need a license. Okay, so that's, that's good. Um, sorry, Comfy. All right, so there's the approval. Um, so that's one of the previous ones. Going to approve that. Send an email, those sort of things, yeah. Okay, so let's give this a few seconds. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, eh?
So let's see if there's there's no runtime exception. So this is the place where they'll tell you if there's runtime exceptions. So there's none of those. So hopefully this will come through anytime soon. So that that all that that flow does is to initiate the process. The rest, the the kit handles. So you don't have to refer back to it. If in fact, if you want to refer back to it, you need to go and have a look at the database tables to see what these things are doing. Um, this is still in preview. So. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's why I think don't wait for this to hit um, like uh, GA. Go and play with it now. Really, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can take away from this. No, the, the, in, at its core, everything that you're seeing here is built around approvals. Right. All right, so Let's just try and see why this is not working. So there's another stage from a previous uh, test that showed up. So that's print stickers. Uh, that's a step name. So, but you'll see a small little niggly. So it's supposed to give me the different the custom actions, but it's not splitting that string. It's just passing it. You know, so it's seeing it as one option essentially. Right. So I'm not sure why that one isn't running. Um, but I, I, I think you get the idea. I'm just going to show you what you'll typically do to build out this process. Um, and why it's a lot easier to do it like this than to to develop all of that. So then I'm going to create another stage. So let's call this approval. So here you could have conditions. So you could go and say that if the value of this thing is greater than 5,000 or whatever, then it splits, the, it branches this. So you could have it go to different people or different uh, roles depending on what the value of the request is and these sort of things. And all of this is driven by these parameters. So if I click on the bottom off of that cancel button and I go into variables, you'll see that I can go and say, uh, let's say amount. Uh, data type is a number. And again, just make sure you're going to add it. Close at, at the bottom off of the button and now we can go and add a stage. Prove the condition is. Okay, let's say the mount field, don't do that, is greater than 500, because that's a good number. If I go and click on save. <laughs> So you'll see there is a value of true. I can add nodes underneath that, or then the value of false, and I can add nodes under that if I wanted to. So over here, we can go and specify an approval, or I can tell it to go directly to another stage. So if it's more than that, it bypasses this stage, and then it'll go into a different stage completely, which is quite nice. Now to do that with the normal 
power automate approvals, you're going to be busy for a while. You know, pack some lunch because you're going to be busy. Um, all right, so let's do here and approver. Just going to make myself the approver again. As I see, Michael is getting anxious to start with his session. Remember the name. So let's do uh, Exco approval over here. Thank you. I was focusing on not forgetting to specify the name. This interface is nice. I like this. I like this a lot. You can do, do quite a. I'd like to see what this code component looks like to see what other things you could possibly do with this. All right, so let's save this. All right, so there you'll see the old one is intact. The new one is now pending. So from the testing so far, they didn't allow me to send it back. I can only send it forward, which is I'm not cra yeah, I'm not that crazy about that. Maybe that's something that'll come. So I'm not sure, I haven't found something around that. There might be something like that, but if if there's not built into the kit, because that action, there's only one action, and that's initiating the flow. So there's nothing that you're listening to. It. <clears throat> but what you could do, so, so what you could do is, if you look at the Dataverse tables, it'll tell you which one of these are complete, and then you can have another flow that'll trigger that. All right, so that's now published. <clears throat> Somebody's looking at my screen. Just stand there. All right, so. If I go and have a look at uh, this flow of mine again, if I edit this, actually I'm just going to close it and open it up again because otherwise it doesn't pick up the new version of the process. So you'll see now immediately it's asking me for the amount. So let's say we're going to pass. Yeah, Michael is saying yeah, he's best biting his knuckles saying, how do they do that? Um, let's go and add a parameter over here. We're looking for a number. And we're just simply going to pass that in here. And then this is the flow. So, so this one over here. Yeah. Okay. So, so then you'll have to pass the the actual ID of that process version to it. So. Yeah. It's got different different IDs to that.
No, main ship. All right, so for whatever reason, this is not giving, maybe it hurt me earlier when I said I'm not a fan of approvals, and now it's, yeah, it's, it's just saying, well, that's fine, I'll show you. So that kicks it off. So if, yeah, so it'll send it to my delegate. So if I go and sign out of office, it'll send it to my delegate, which, which is, is good, but it's, it opens up a bigger discussion because I might, if I go and leave, I might delegate certain processes to Mike, but other processes might go to somebody else. It's not always that same person, but I suppose this is, <clears throat> All right, so let me quickly show you. So Michael really wants to get going with these sessions. I'm not going to take up too much of your time. There'll be another, we'll do another session in this. We will actually show you some more advanced stuff when, when it matures a bit. Um, but essentially, I just want to show you what the solution looks like. And uh, the business approval kit solution. So there's 23 flows in this bad boy that does things like so, so, so there's a start approval. So I think I've got a good idea what that does. So I think there's 23 flows and there's 29 entities in Dataverse that it keeps track of all of these things. So it's a it's a big app. So, so they actually, this is strange. They're actually, not the one I checked previously had error checking in this. This one actually doesn't have error checking yet. So yes, it's in preview. Um, but then essentially, if you, if I look at these, the custom pages you asked about earlier. So there's the home page, process designer. So this is the this has to be a code component of some sort. Um, let's actually see what this thing looks like. And then 29 entities. So oh, this is a managed solution. So we'll have to edit it in, in developer. Um, I think they do. I can't recall. I think they do actually. Um, <clears throat> as, if you're going to have a look at if you look at the GitHub, there's, there's all of this is stored in GitHub, so you should be able to look at that. Yes. It'll it'll use the Office 365 connector to get your manager. So if it's specified in Azure AD or Entra, then it'll it'll actually just read it from there. Yeah. Well, that's probably the most up to date from what we've seen because people shout when the, the thing in, in in Teams and Delve and what's the other, what's the new version of Delve? Viva. If that's not correct, then. All right, so guys, I think in a in a nutshell, that's that's what the approvals is moving towards. Is it there yet? No, not quite. I think it's going to get there. I think this is going to get a lot of attention. Um, it's using a lot of the new components in the from the creator kit. So if you install this, you need to install the creator kit and then you install this one. So the, the cat guys are doing some really great work on, on all of this. And I think this is a, if, if that's the only thing you do with this, go and look at how they've built this because you can definitely learn a thing or two from that. So we'll do another session probably in a month or two, two or three maybe. We will build some really advanced um, approvals on this and then we'll kick the tires a bit and see what it does. Lebo, you've got a question. Um, so it was just to read Daryl's comment in the chat uh, in response to the troubleshooting you were doing. He mm -hmm. says he's asking if it's not because you're testing the runtime and suggest that that if you try and run 
the flow not from a test phase, then maybe it should work. Yeah, uh, sorry, doctor. Does. Is it because you're doing that test that it's not kicking off an actual action or an approval? It's just testing it. Um, we actually requested an approval, would it not work? You know, try to. Let's try that, see what it does. Give me, give me 30 seconds, Michael. All right, so I'm just going to run it. See if that does the trick. See if we can go and track instances. So if we go into the approval center, there is uh, approval instances over here. Yes. All right. So yeah, I'm not sure. It's still not kicking off. So <laughs> yeah, we'll 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 figure that out. We'll 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 do that in a in a month or two. Thank you very much, guys. Any other questions? Good. Thank you, Michael. Over to you. <laughs> okay. Give me two seconds while I set up. Okay, so I'm doing the tech tip, and the tech tip, I've already forgotten the title. C Sharp, oh yes, yes, yes. Use native C Sharp, or use C Sharp natively in the Power Platform. So that's the title of my tech tip, but let me first start off with a bit of background as to what I was trying to solve. So I was building this little POC for an organization, and I'm not going to give too much background in terms of what the POC actually does. Um, but it's basically around this concept of key performance indicators. And you have like this parent's key performance indicator, uh, which is a roll up of child performance indicators. Does that make sense? It's kind of like Viva Goals. So I'm just rebuilding Viva Goals. Okay. Um, not quite. It's a little bit different to that. But. Anyway, so what you will see here, this is a parent performance indicator, and it's got an output value here of 99. Okay, so that's the parent indicator, but that's actually made up of child indicators. Can you see a child indicators? Here they are. One's got a value of 43, and one's got a value of 56. And if I add them together, if you're very good at math, you'll get to 99. But what happens is when they define the, the parent indicator, the formula of the calculation of the child indicators will differ. So for this specific one, it's one plus two, but maybe it needs to be one divided by two, or maybe it needs to be one plus two times 365, 100%. So you want this mathematical formula in here. And it's different for each record. Does that make sense? So I'm like, okay, cool. And let's just check that this works. So I've just changed it now. Uh, so let me just save this formula. Why? Yeah, but it's not gonna, hopefully it's not 99. 
Um, and let me just go into one of these and change the value. So the whole solution, this is not actually the UI for the solution. There's a Canvas app for the solution where people go and capture their values. But um, I'm just going to make this, well, it doesn't matter. I don't have to change it, do I? Ugh, well, just, we'll do that, 500. Um, it's, it, the way it runs is it only runs, um, yeah, when it's complete. So I'm just going to change this back to complete just to force it. Okay. So now it's this formula, 1 plus 2, 556 times 365. Okay, so here's the, the challenge was, how do you do this? How do you do this? And, and, I'd, and I've done it one way, and I'd love to, <laughs> I've probably done it like, probably not the right way, or maybe not the easiest way, but I'd love to get anybody's feedback in terms of, how do you do this type of thing? Because you can't use a, a formula column and you can't use a calculated column because those, then you're hard coding the expression into the column. But this is going to differ every time for every record I add. So the user is deciding what the expression is, not the designer of the table. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did think of a flow and I phoned David. That was the first person I phoned. I'm like, dude, I need help building a flow that can like separate that expression out and then look for certain characters in it if it's a plus or a divide. Um, and then replace the numbers of what it finds here into that. And 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 then it's like, well, what happens if we need brackets? So this thing needs to become more complicated because actually maybe. It's that, you know, and the, maybe it's not just two records in here, there's 50 records in here or whatever it might be. So using a flow to do this is quite hard. It's very, very hard. Any other ideas? Rod, it's got an idea. Maybe you can use C sharp. Um, so yes, you can use C sharp. So for example, you could go and build an Azure function, right? Um, and in your Azure function, you can write C Sharp or Python. And what you could do is you could pass this in as a string into that function. So maybe in your flow, all you do is you find and replace everything with one with the value of what comes out of the first record and everything with two with a value that comes out of the second record. Then you take that string now, which is essentially your perfect mathematical formula, and you pass that into an Azure function and then in C sharp, there is logic that allows you just to say, here's a string executed. Or in Python, here's a string executed. Make sense? Pardon? Not chat GPT, because it might get it wrong. Uh, it has to be 100% accurate every time. So you could definitely do it with an Azure function. Yeah, it would be cool. It would be so cool if there was just a way you could execute code natively without having to call an Azure function. Because an Azure function is cool, but I think it's overkill just for this. And also I wanted to have one solution file I could email someone and they could just import the solution file and it'll just work. They don't have to deploy an Azure function. So the other option was a server-side assembly, a DLL, a plugin. So the Dataverse supports plugins, they server-side C-sharp code. You could also do it like that, but then I had to go and compile it and test it and deploy it. And I'm like, no, that's also too much effort. So I came up with this weird idea, which happened to be like by accident, because I was explaining this problem to someone. And then we veered off onto another conversation around custom connectors. And then it dawned upon me. Do you know that in a custom connector, you can write C-sharp code? Okay, so. Let's jump to my custom connector here. 
So I've got a few custom connectors I mess around with over time, but here's the one that I built. It's called the math calculator. So usually a custom connector is essentially a text file. It's a description file of how you connect to an API. So the point is I want my Power App to call an API, or I want my Power App to, or my Power Automate Flow to call an API, some type of REST endpoint. So you go and define a custom connector, and what you're defining is how it's going to call this HTTP endpoint, this REST endpoint. So what I've done is I've built a custom connector that never calls an endpoint. So the URL, the host you'll see here, is bing.com. It'll never call bing.com. I can put anything in there. I'm not actually calling it. And then what you do is when you define your custom connector, uh, let's just go. <laughs> just when you thought Bing was actually going to do something. Uh, so you go to the definition. I created this like little, um, I call it, I guess, a, a function called run calculation, which is all defined as if it's actually going to go and call something on Bing.com called run calculation, but it never does. And then what you do is in the code section, you override everything. So there's a code section here. And this code section is C sharp. So in the C-sharp code, I don't call the endpoint, but I essentially execute the string and it comes back with an answer. It's brilliant, it's brilliant. It's so cool because you can call, you can have C-sharp code execute from a Power Automate flow or from a Power App or from wherever, but you don't host the C-sharp. It's hosted in this connector and this connector never calls anything. Yes, there are a few caveats. There are only certain namespaces you can call here. So you can call, you know, system.xml, system.xml.xsl, system.http, system.web. There's a bunch, but for example, the one that I first wanted to use, I actually couldn't call. So actually to do this calculation, I'm actually doing it as part of um, XPath. So I'm using XPath to actually do it. So I'm not going to show you all the C sharp code because that's not really that relevant. Um, but how oh, cool. So now in theory, I can go here and let me just test this. So now I've got this run calculation and I give it, I don't know, 70 plus 6 times 200. And there's the result. And it never called Bing. <laughs> okay. Hey, how cool is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um and um yeah, so it works with brackets, it it's just legendary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, you can you can add your own functions into the class. So there's one class here that inherits from script base that's always there. And then basically what happens is this method here called task is called when any of your slash functions are called on your HTTP request. So basically what I'm saying is if it's slash run calculation, then I'm actually going to jump down to this little piece of code here. Yeah. So I could have this thing with slash run calculation slash you know do x do y so this thing can actually support lots of different c sharp kind of calculations or things i want to do um, and then what app what actually happens now when you go in here nowhere here am i actually calling the http endpoint of bing because the way that this works is if i actually wanted to call bing or that endpoint api i'd have to actually do it here i'd have to call it myself and, and this is designed for scenarios more like, actually my endpoint is a SOAP XML endpoint. So I'm gonna call it and then I'm gonna transform it to JSON to give back to the, to the, the platform. Or you wanna transform the JSON that comes back or you wanna add extra headers before it goes out. That's usually what it's for. But here I'm just not calling the HTTP endpoint at all. Um, and I'm just going and bringing in that string. Um, so here comes the string, and then this little XSLT function here or formula 
does the calculation and returns a result. So that's what comes back. <laughs> you could do approvals like this. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, so if I jump to my, so I do have a Power Automate flow that runs behind the scenes, but the Power Automate flow does a find and replace, essentially. Find number one and replace it with a value of one. Find number two, replace it with a value of two. And then it calls the, yeah, you know, it passes the string to the connector, which executes and then gives the value back. So. So it's basically like there's like a there's like a for each, so it loops through every single child KPI. So if there's 400 KPIs, it'll loop through every single one of them. If there's two, and then for each one, it just replaces the parameter in the top, in the parents. So it's actually a very basic flow. Like it's not huge at all. I've got a few extra steps so that it won't try and do it if, for example, they didn't put the curly bracket on either side of the number one. You know, so I made it a curly bracket one, curly bracket, curly bracket two, curly bracket. So there are no curly brackets in the string at all. It doesn't run. So there's a few little things like that. But ultimately, right at the end, yeah, yeah, it runs the calculation. It passes in that value and gets something back. And then it, it updates the parent record. Yes, yeah. It's documented. So just go and search on the web, you know, uh, custom connector C sharp or code, um, and it tells you which ones are supported in here and which ones aren't. You can't add your own. You can't go in here and say, you know, namespace system.xml or whatever. They're already there, and you can just use the ones that are there. Uh, but there's JSON ones, XML ones, all like HTTP web type of ones. And then, yeah. So that is how you get native <laughs> C-sharp capability into the Power Platform, which I think is quite cool. <laughs> um, are there any questions online? Um, and just by the way, if you are interested in the solution and this connector, um, you can either just email me, but I also have put them on GitHub. So GitHub, uh, there's my, my handle, m-o'donovan. And it's this one here called Circular88. It's a it's a KPI solution for public sector. Um, it needs to be in a specific way and doesn't Viva doesn't doesn't meet the requirements. Um, so yeah, there you go. The end. Do you want to close out? Uh, so. Remember bootcamp 2nd of March for everyone that's online. I think we've got about 140 people that have registered. Um, somewhere around there. And we're probably going to go to about 200, somewhere around there. So if you don't register soon, you're not going to be able to come. It is free. Um, knowledge is free. So yeah, do register. Um, and that's it. Thanks everyone for joining. See you next month, second Tuesday of March. See you here or online. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Cheers.